Welcome in, everyone. Hello, everybody. This is Everything Sucks, Let's Fix It, episode 28. My name is Ben Mayer. My name is Anthony Buono. Today is December 19th, 2023. We are coming to you from a brand new desk. I am so excited about this. I finally hopped on the trend of having a standing desk. So this thing can move up and down, and it gives me much more space to be away from this grimy guy. Yeah. So that's good. It's very fortunate for you. We have enough space that we can have notepads and actually take notes on what each other are saying, which is awesome. It's so cool. And you know what else is really cool? Guys, we have reached 1,000 YouTube subscribers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. I can't believe it. This is so cool. I'm so glad so many people are watching and enjoying. Um, it really means a lot. So. Yeah, it is really exciting. Yeah, this happened last night. So it, it's just, it's really humbling. It's cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's get into our first story. We're going to start off a little light today, lighter than usual. We're going to hop on the Republican primary debacle um, and the clown show that that is. Um, ben made a really good point. Yeah, uh, last week we were filming, and I talked about it for a little while. And he's like, you know, that that's a lot of really good analysis for a race that's already over. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's funny, but there are some important developments that I think go beyond just who's going to be the president, right? I yeah, I agree. So here we go. We have Meatball Ron, our boy Ronald DeSantis. Um, he has. Uh, outsourced a lot of his campaign activity to a super PAC called Never Back Down. This Never Back Down super PAC had developed a huge war chest of money and was basically designed to fuel DeSantis's campaign against Donald Trump. Uh, we covered previously that Never Back Down was also doing like canvassing operations for Ron DeSantis, and we thought that was really weird because normally super PACs don't do canvassing operations. Mm -mm. Normally, it's the campaigns that do the canvassing operations. Yeah, the super PACs are specifically supposed to be excluded from canvassing canvassing operations because they're not supposed to be involved in campaign operations. Right. They're never supposed to coordinate activities with the actual candidate. But we're all kind of we know that Never Back Down was working with Ron DeSantis the whole time. Like everyone was aware of that. Yeah. They call they were calling it Ron DeSantis's super PAC. Mm-hmm. Um, well, now there's a legal challenge to this. The Campaign Legal Center has filed a complaint with the Federal Election Commission on Monday, um, and they're specifically saying that Never Back Down PAC is directly coordinating with the DeSantis campaign and is looking to get them fined and shut down their operations. The guys running Never Back Down have come out and said, they're like, no, 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 we, we're totally independent. We have no, you know, we're, we're not directly working with the Ron DeSantis. Absolutely not. That's not happening. But it's just an obvious lie. Yeah. Which is wild. I would never have expected them to actually get punished for it. No, me neither. It's really cool to see that the lawsuit is coming. We still have to see if they get punished, right? Sure. We have to see if they get punished, but it's good that the lawsuit is at least coming up. Yeah. So, because we don't want this to become the norm. Exactly. We, we would hate for this to become the operating procedure of how to run a presidential campaign. Agreed. It is good that it is being enforced. Yeah. So Ron DeSantis is in trouble, not just in legal fights, apparently, but also in the polling. Shocker. Shocker, right? Yeah. I yeah. feel like I feel like so many people were hopeful about this guy. Oh, yeah. And it's just like the, the weeks that gone by, I could feel, I could just feel everyone realizing that he's not who they thought he was. Yeah. Well, I just think about how many times I've checked the polling averages. And every time I look back at when DeSantis first announced, or before DeSantis announced himself for the race, when he was behind Trump by maybe three points, four points in the polling averages. And it's just remarkable to me that that could have been the case. I do know Republicans think, they still think he's a great governor. Mm -hmm. They kind of when I watch Republican media, I see them kind of feeling bad for him and being like, just be okay with being a great governor. Dude. Yeah. It's okay. You didn't have to push harder than that. But since he was so close in the polling, it's just been like this tumble down a mountain where Trump has been tumbling up one, right? And they're just diverging. Oh, and it's, it's just like, uh, I don't know who was telling him in his ear that he's like some, you know, Christ figure to lead the Republican Party out of Trump. You know, and he he was going to get anointed. And then he comes in and Nikki Haley seems to be basically tied with him nationally Mm -hmm. and is now wiping the floor with him in New Hampshire. Yeah. So Nikki Haley is, I think, surging at the right time for to be a competitor, not necessarily the winner, but to be a competitor. Obviously, Trump is still way ahead. But the point is that she looks like she can at least be somewhat competitive. So Nikki Haley has been endorsed by the governor of New Hampshire, Chris Sununu. Chris Sununu is a very popular governor in New Hampshire. He is has a good crossover appeal with Democrats and Republicans. He's like, you know, kind of the poster child of a moderate Republican. Um, and now 
Nikki Haley got his endorsement. So Nunu to me is the Republican Andy Bashir. That's a great, great analogy. Yeah. yeah. Andy Bashir, guy from Kentucky, won the governor race 2023 as a Democrat in Kentucky. Very similar to Chris Sununu. Exactly yeah. the same vibe. Yeah. There was a lot of push to get Chris Sununu to run for the Senate seat in New Hampshire in 2022. Mm. But Chris Sununu decided not to do it. Yeah. And a lot of Republicans blamed him for losing the Senate because of that. Because honestly, Chris Sununu would have beat Maggie Hassan. There's no doubt in my mind, to be honest. Okay. But now, here is our newest polling from out of New Hampshire. Trump at 44, Nikki Haley at 29, DeSantis at 11, Christie at 10, Ramaswamy, Hutchison, five or below. So Nikki Haley coming within 20 points to Trump, coming within 20 points doesn't sound like that great, but only being 15 points behind is not bad. No, as far as, I mean, you, you started this off by saying she's surging at the right time. It is funny that being 15 points down is surging, but it it is because usually it's 30 points down has been the norm for yes. most of this race. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I, I am pretty impressed by it. It does seem to... It gives me the impression that she might have a chance in New Hampshire. Yeah. And winning in New Hampshire obviously doesn't mean she can win nationally, Mm -hmm. but it means she might be able to propel herself to a better showing in South Carolina and a better showing on Super Tuesday than people would have expected. Yeah. And, you know, you never know what can happen at a convention. So I just think Mm -hmm. it's interesting that Nikki Haley really is surging at the right time. And she's facing a lot of flack now because she needs to go beyond the anti-Trumpers, right? She needs to not just coalesce with the Christie vote because that Christie vote is at 10%, right? Mm-hmm. That's the hard anti-Trump. She doesn't need, only need to get and consolidate the Christie vote. She needs to tap into the DeSantis and a bit of the Trump vote too. Mm-hmm. And DeSantis voters are not anti-Trump voters. That's not how that works. No. So she needs to have this broader appeal, and it's making it very difficult when she goes on national media. She was interviewed this weekend, um, I think on Meet the Press or Face the Nation, one of those shows, and she was asked pretty point blank, like, how do you feel about Donald Trump's current rhetoric around calling your political enemies vermin or saying that he's going to be a dictator on day one and go after all of his enemies and enact retribution and all she could say was i don't know why you're so obsessed with the guy well i'm sorry nikki haley we're so obsessed with the guy because he's running in the lead of your party's presidential nomination procedure he's leading you in the primary we're all concerned about him because he might be the president of the United States come two years from now. Yeah, obviously. He is the one who was your boss a few years ago when you were the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Right. Why wouldn't we be obsessed with him? Why would we possibly be more obsessed with you than we are with him? And it's seems like a much more consequential human. And it doesn't seem like we're obsessed with him. It seems like the Republican base is obsessed with him. Mm. Because even after everything, they're still giving him 44% of the vote in New Hampshire, 60% of the vote nationally. We're not obsessed with him. Your party is obsessed with him. And you need to tell us why that is. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. if you need to make the case, why is your party obsessed with Trump? Now, I want to go off on something that Trump has said this week that I think is extremely notable, and it's important to keep track of Trump's ensuing um, demonizing rhetoric against those who are the other. Mm -hmm. We know that Trump has said some terrible things about minorities in the past. We know all that. We know his policies were terrible against immigrants and uh, undocumented people during his administration. But his rhetoric has gone above and beyond in a way that it's important to recognize. Trump gave a speech this week talking very heavily about immigration. And he said that this is an evasion like it's a military invasion. Trump said that drugs, criminals, gang members, and terrorists are pouring into our country at record levels. We've never seen anything like it. They're taking over our cities. Now, we know that undocumented immigrants are less likely to commit crimes, so they are not causing the surge in crime in the cities. That's not true. Mm -mm. Um, And there is genuinely absolutely no distinguishable difference between this type of rhetoric and what you saw that was during like the anti-Irish age of America or the anti-Italian age of America. This is exactly the same. This is exactly the same to people being afraid that syndicalists and socialists were coming in from Italy and causing the bombings that happened in Chicago. That was more German immigrants, but the point stays the same. Irish immigrants, they thought, you know, they were going to turn the country Catholic and destroy the foundation of our democracy. It's all baseless, xenophobic lies. Yeah. And the worst part was he goes on and on. And then he says that he accuses the immigrants of poisoning our blood, which is such a potent hatred 
Yeah. It, th- that that phrase has such a, po- a potent, potent hatred to, to it that I can't I can't imagine uttering something like that about another human being. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, we talked a few weeks ago because he used this phrase before, um, and it's almost more to me. It's almost more concerning now than when he first use it used it because now all of the backlash has happened True. right in the media and yet he decided to go out and use that again mm-hmm. um which to me says that he's going to be that much more brazen if he does get into office which of course goes along with him saying that he's going to be a dictator on day one which enforces which is it's it's all enforced because he hmm, it seems clear that he isn't worried about losing political support totally. for saying these things, um, which means there's no check on him. Right. If he if 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 the public is not going to be responsive to this type of rhetoric, what will they be responsive to? Yeah. And like, look, I have some quotes here that are from far right leaders of the past. I'm not going to read them out. There's no reason for me to do that. But just it is exactly repl- replicable to what was going on in yeah. the 30s, okay? Mm-hmm. It is in the in Germany. It is exactly, explicitly the same. And the way that he's saying about poisoning your blood, how do you poison the blood of a country? How do you do that? Yeah. You interbreed. Is he, like, saying, like, how do you, like, yes. just, he's, he's, it's almost like he's blatantly white nationalist and is yes. signaling that he's afraid of the destruction of the white race through interbreeding yes. when he says poisoning the blood. Exactly. He's very clearly hinting at that and and hinting doesn't even feel like the right word he's just saying saying right there's no other way to interpret it yeah right so Mm -hmm. now this is dangerous because this is coming at a time when americans when polled have a decreasing approval rating of immigrants so uh, gallup asks in your view should immigration be kept as it's at its present values increased or or decreased during the trump administration we saw public opinion swing more towards more immigrants Mm -hmm. we saw empathy and a little more sympathy and solidarity with immigrants coming to the country and we wanted more of them now since trump has come to office that number has declined and declined rapidly now 41 percent of americans say that they want a decreased amount of immigrations 31 percent they want the same only 26 percent say they want more this 41 number of decreased immigration um, is the same that it was in like 2012 so it looks like we've like lost a bunch of progress we've made against the anti-immigrant fight in America. This is interesting to me because it seems like um, anti-immigrant sentiment based on this graph bottomed out near 2020, near the end of Trump's term. Mm -hmm. And it's been on the rise since, which makes me wonder, is it have have conservatives honed in more on the anti-immigrant rhetoric as something that will resonate with people to in an attempt to gain political favor Mm -hmm. right like only since they've been out of power and they thought they didn't need it until now right i think i think a lot of people forgot how bad trump was towards immigrants to be honest okay i think that's what it was i think when it was right in their face and they saw it that's when we saw the we want more immigrants right but now that it's out of the picture we are not seeing trump do the damages okay it seems like seeing the the People rounded up in camps uh, exactly. by ICE at the border. And we've talked about what Trump wants to do. He doesn't just want people rounded up in camps by the border. He wants people rounded up in camps across the country. Yes. Sent to Texas. That's what he wants. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now this is a Fox News poll. This Fox News poll, I think, says a lot about people's feeling towards immigrants that are more important than those initial numbers we said. That captures the overall sentiment. I understand. But this, I think, is super important. So Fox News poll. Illegal immigrants and border security percent favorable proposals. So, like, do how many people support increasing border agents? 79% of people. Okay, fine. Deporting illegal immigrants, 67%. Pe- uh, penalizing hiring illegals, 64%. So, those are inter- letting those with jobs stay, 62%. Hmm. That number is what I find the most interesting. Yeah. Because the vast majority of illegal immigrants have jobs yeah there are i think three point yeah 3.2 percent of america's population are made up of undocumented workers but they make up 4.4 percent of the entire nation's workforce Mm. they are the most likely group in america to be employed yeah so if we can get that 62 percent of americans who say that they want to you know 
get a path to citizenship for those with jobs, where's that messaging? Yeah. That's what we need to be riding home with. It To me, it, it makes clear that people still think that immigrants are just burdens to the welfare system. Yes. They right? think they're takers. Yes. Yes. Rather than givers to the economy, which they are. And we're not seeing, from, from my perspective, I'm not seeing a strong democratic pushback. Mm. I'm not seeing someone take up the fight and make the case no. that like, look, okay, the 62% of people, we have a majority. Where's your immigration bill that increases border agents, but then gives a pass to citizenship for those with jobs? Yeah, no, Democrats don't take this issue head on as far as I've observed either. They, they rather, they try to push it to the side. We've talked already about how Biden feels if he or he, he likes to shy away from this issue because he thinks it is kind of a political mine, mm -hmm. like a landmine. Um, I think you're right. I agree, obviously, that if they did go head on, um, they could win this argument. I think it, I don't think it's so unintuitive that immigrants can be helpful to the economy. Exactly. And we, we can't forget what Trump did. Like the guy was already president. We know that he didn't just go after illegal immigrants that were criminals and were unemployed, fix, uh, taking money from the welfare state. First of all, because there, there aren't very avenues for illegal immigrants to get money from the welfare state. But he goes after specifically employed undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. He carried out the largest single state immigration enforcement operation in the entire nation's history in Mississippi, rounding up 680 undocumented immigrants in one day. These were these were people who had some had been in the United States for over a decade. Their kids were in school and then their parents never came to pick them up because they got deported. That's insane. It's insane. So yeah. like this 62% of Americans who want a path to citizenship for those who are illegally here, we agree with you. The Democrats agree with you on that. Do not fall into the xenophobic trap where you're voting for a guy who's saying that they're poisoning the blood of our country. If you have the sympathy to recognize that, hey, they're working hard just like I am. Let them stay here and contribute the same way I do. Yeah. Because they all want the same thing. There are really good videos of people talking to the undocumented immigrants who are coming across the border, and all of them are just so excited to be there and excited to be Americans and yes. excited to work. Yes, they, they're literally excited to work. Like They're excited to have an opportunity to make money exactly. because that's the thing that they've been deprived. So it's not that they want to, they, they're not excited about the opportunity to receive handouts. They're excited for the opportunity to feel empowered themselves to make the life for themselves. Exactly. And we just cannot allow Trump's xenophobic rhetoric to work. We have to be stronger than that. We have to push back from that. And the Democratic Party needs to take this forward and say, no, we do not think that they're poisoning the blood of our country. Put it over the airwaves everywhere mm -hmm. that the Republican Party thinks that Latino immigrants are poisoning the blood of the country. Get that on every TV station across the country right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so in another big piece of news that happened just a couple days ago, U.S. Steel agreed to a sale to Nippon Steel for $14.1 billion. So Nippon is a Japanese firm, and Japan is one of the most industrious, one of the leading steel producers in the world. Um, Nippon, the, the agreement was that Nippon will pay $55 per share in cash, which is compared to a $35 per share offer that Cleveland Cliffs, which is an American steel producer, made in August. This would make the Japanese firm the third largest steel producer in the world um, and will generally shake up the entire industry, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really interesting. Obviously, the union, uh, the U.S. Steel Workers Union has already come out and said that they are not in favor of this. They're mm -hmm. hesitant to support this. Um, Senators J.D. Vance from Ohio and uh, Senator John Fetterman from Pennsylvania, J.D. Vance, Republican, John Fetterman, Democrat, um, ha are, have expressed concerns about this from a national security perspective, the fact that U.S. steel production um, is shifting towards a foreign-owned company. Mm -hmm. We definitely think this is a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. So I think we can start with the national security issue. Yeah, let's start with national, national security. I'm not concerned about the national security issue because I think Japan is one of our most trustworthy allies, if not the most trustworthy. Not to mention they're already highly prosperous on their own. So I'm not worried about 
um, them trying to like extract value, like excess value from Amer- the American workforce to bring back into their own country. In a yeah. Way. No, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I think like the person who is concerned about national security, like they, like I, I think that we talked about how before the podcast we were talking about like, you know, why is this bad from a national security perspective? I don't really see it because mm-hmm. again, Japan is like our closest ally, right? Mm-hmm. Well, if we wanted to, if we came into some big crisis and we needed to use the Defense Production Act where we needed to directly say which companies need to produce which things, right? Like we did with COVID. We said that uh, General Motors and Ford, we threatened to use the Defense Production Act to make them produce ventilators instead of cars for a little while, right? So now, are do we have that same flexibility if this steel company is now owned by a Japanese firm? The answer is kind of hazy. Um, the research that we've been able to done has shown that the Defense Production Act can be a little more complicated to use mm. against foreign-owned firms. It has a lot more legal issues. It can cause diplomatic tensions with the state of Japan, given that it's such a big industry and all that. Yeah. But then again, you brought up a good point. It's like, if we need to ha- create steel for national security, we're going to create steel for national security, whether it's Japanese-owned or not. Exactly. Like, quite frankly, if there's a national security issue, no amount of diplomatic tension is really going to get in the way of us co-opting a steel production facility or plant that we need to make enough steel to achieve our goals. Yeah. And I don't think, and I think if that were the case, if there were a big enough emergency, I don't imagine um, diplomatic relations with Japan would actually be hurt that bad because mm-hmm. they're going to see us and understand why we needed to do it. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this from a national security perspective, like if this was a Chinese owned firm mm-hmm. buying out U.S. steel. Yeah. Yeah. I would be against it wholeheartedly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Because also China is one of the... China might be the leading steel producing country in the world right now. It is, yeah. So I don't want to give it even more leverage Mm -hmm. over that extremely important material, not only for military applications, but also important in a bunch of technology that we need for the green transition. We talk about electric steel being a big one. Exactly. We have a... Right now, there's a shortage of transformers, which we need for new electric generators to be able to modulate how much output they're giving at any given time. There's a shortage of transformers because there's a shortage of electric steel. And we're worried, I think for good reason, that China will tighten their, will kind of close the faucet of their steel production to make that issue even worse for us. Mm -hmm. We don't want to give them that kind of leverage to do it. Right. So the national security question really comes down to which country is buying it. Mm -hmm. Because we talk a lot about decoupling from China and onshoring, but we also talk about friendshoring. And this is, I think, just kind of in the realm of friendshoring our supply chain. So from a national security perspective, I'm not too scared about it. I think it makes a lot of sense. Agreed. Um, J.D. Vance and John Fetterman are going to go to the Treasury Secretary and protest based off national security grounds. Mm. Um, we'll see where that goes. I think I think that would be a legitimate mistake. Like I don't think that's just a neutral. I think if we start if we start wanting to onshore things to such an extent that we don't want an ally like Japan mm-hmm. to be able to own a company that's largely operated in America, then I'm scared we're getting to the point where like, we want an entire American supply chain. And that's just going to raise costs yes. for a lot of things. But now, you're, you're not... You, that is correct. I agree with you. But I think it goes beyond that. And there is a political calculation to why they're doing it that I think everyone is aware of. Mm. That is the only tool that the senators have to slow it down. Mm. And they're buying time for the union to negotiate with the guys with the companies okay like i don't think i think a lot of i think a lot of john fetterman's and honestly jd vance's maybe their concerns i think are less with the national security truly Mm. and more with trying to get the better deal for the workers and doing every pulling every lever they can okay to make that deal better i mean if that's true i'm on board i expected the union so should we shift to the union conversation so now let's shift to the union conversation so the big issue that came out with this is that the united steel workers union was angry when they heard this news. And they said that they had not been consulted about the sale before it went through, which is specifically part of their agreement. Right. This is a breach of contract with U.S. Steel with the union. Yeah. And so they said, our union intends to exercise the full measure of our agreements to ensure that whatever happens next with U.S. Steel, we protect the good family sustaining jobs we bargained. We also will strongly urge government regulators to carefully scrutinize this acquisition and determine if the proposed transaction serves the national security interest of the U.S. and, and benefits, benefits workers. workers. 
Yeah. So obviously neither of us are against the the union being involved in the decision Mm -hmm. and giving it the go ahead because if they didn't then i would also be concerned that nippon had no intention on upholding the recent four-year contract that the union signed with the company in December of last year. Exactly. And and, and the U.S. Steel has a lot of long-term liability contracts with um, the, U- the United Steel Workers Union has a lot of long-term liability contracts with U.S. Steel mm. in regards to their pensions and, sec- and retiree benefits. And they aren't sure if Nippon is going to continue those benefits as promised in their four-year, uh, promised in their agreements. Yeah. Now, Nippon has come out and said that they will be wholeheartedly in support of the contract and operate it in good faith and all that. But that's not something we can just wholeheartedly trust if the union wasn't at the negotiating table. Look at, you know, J- Japanese car manufacturer Toyota and how they built up uh, plants and factories in the southern parts of the United States where union laws were the weakest, specifically for the purposes of avoiding unions. So I'm not totally convinced that foreign companies will have. Uh, a similar interest in abiding by a U.S. you know union negotiated deal. Yeah, and it's definitely fair for them to just want to get it in writing, right? Like yeah. it, it's in writing with U.S. Steel, but it's not in writing with Nippon. Let's mm-hmm. get it in writing with Nippon. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I guess I didn't think about the congressional or the senators protesting in that way because I just assumed that this deal will be held up by the courts as long as the union protests, Mm -hmm. which maybe is too optimistic, but I think also because we have the administration we do right now, which is so friendly to unions, I would think that it'll be slowed down until there is complete union approval. And in that case, once once the union does approve, I'm happy with this deal going through. Yeah, I am on board once the union approves it. Once Nippon has made it clear that they're going to follow through with the union negotiated contract with all the long-term liabilities, retirees, and pensions, I'm honestly for it. I yeah. think it's bad that there's a larger conglomeration of the steel production industry generally. I think that's bad, but that was going to happen either way. Mm-hmm. U.S. steel was going down. Whether it's bought by a U.S. company or a Japanese company, who cares? I mean, honestly, from an ideological perspective, they're capitalists all the same. Yeah. Right? A Japanese capitalist versus an American capitalist, who really cares? It's not like the company could have been owned by the workers, right? Yeah. So, like, at the end of the day, we're just trading capitalist for capitalist. There's really no difference. Yeah. If anything, at the end of the day, I'm glad that the company sold for more to the, the foreign company. Like, that, the difference in $55 per share versus, no, versus 35 right? That That's more money coming into our GDP. But also, um, I'm glad that a Japanese company did it because... All reporting that I've read says that the Japanese steel industry is more advanced than ours. Oh, way more advanced. More productive. Yeah, and so like Nippon is going to bring in more investment that U.S. Steel couldn't. Yeah. Nippon has more capital to invest. Exactly. Probably probably to create more jobs too. Yeah. Right? uh, There's no evidence that I've seen to say that Nippon is going to cut jobs in the United States with the steel plant. They wouldn't be paying $55 a share if that's what their plan, right? Exactly. This is probably just going to beef up the American-based supply chain, even if it is being bought by a Japanese company. They're not yeah. going to shut down steel plants. This is going to make our... This is going to help things like our transition to the green economy, yeah. right? And it could. And I honestly, it's going to help with our local steel production, right? Yes. It's going to help with our local steel production. Donald Trump and Joe Biden have both been trying to increase our local steel production. This is one area where both sides have agreed. Um, Trump, during his time in office, put a 25% tariff on all steel imports, mm-hmm. which was already kind of an iffy policy because we, you know how we feel about tariffs if you mm-hmm. watch the show. Um, But Trump and Biden actually renegotiated these deals so that there was a quota on the amount of foreign steel that was allowed to enter the U.S. market as opposed to a generalized tariff. Um, And the infrastructure law passed by Biden and the Inflation Reduction Act has done a lot to boost national steel demand. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't. But this is leading to a lot of uh, subsidized steel coming in from China. And because the Chinese government subsidizes their steel like crazy. Yeah. Right? Specifically so they can capture the entirety of the market and drive everyone else out of business. Exactly. exactly. That's exactly their plan. Yeah. So I'm glad that this should combat that to some extent. Yeah. I, it, it's definitely, it has its ups and downs. If the union comes out against it, then, you know, if the workers aren't getting their fair shake that they negotiated for, then that's not fair. Yeah. Right? Absolutely not. All right. Next. Oh, baby. All right. Yeah, this was interesting. This was super interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So 
are we going to get deflation for Christmas? We've talked so much about inflation and we've talked about so much of disinflation, but what about deflation? So what's inflation? Inflation is when the price of things go up. Disinflation? Well, disinflation is when the price of things go up, but slower than as they were going up before, a slower rate of inflation. Well, what's deflation? Well, that's when prices are going down. Well, it looks like We've, avoid, we've avoided deflation for a long time in the United States. We've been in disinflation for a while. Our inflation rate is coming down. This past month, we're at like 3.1, 3.2%, something around there. Now we have top executives of uh, top retailers saying that we could actually see decreases in prices, not just decreases in the rate of increases, but genuine decreases in prices. They say that toys are almost 3% cheaper this Christmas than uh, government data shows from last year. They have sport equipment down nearly 2%. Bigger, tip, bigger ticket items are also seeing declines of washing machines costing 12% less than a year ago. Eggs uh, are 22% less than they were a year ago. So we're seeing a genuine decline in prices in very specific goods. Um, forecasters are estimating that uh, physical products will keep falling within the next year. Uh, so these are all manufactured goods that are going to be seeing a deflation in prices. Mm -hmm. And consumers have been remarkably resilient so far in the last year. We had a record setting 5.2% GDP growth in quarter three of 2023. And the main driver of that was consumption. Yeah, We saw a massive amount in consumption and our data shows that that the American consumer has a couple, has more money to spend. Real disposable income in the United States is above what it was pre-COVID. So real disposable income is increasing. And we have the personal saving rates decreasing. So people are saving less of their money and choosing to spend more of it, which yeah. means that they feel pretty comfortable with where they're at right now. Yeah. And I think this trend is only going to continue that. It's only going to boost that. Um, first of all, I assume this is happening mostly because supply chain issues have been resolved. That's exactly right. Right. Like like when you say when you mention eggs have dropped 22 percent, a big problem with eggs, or at least it was reported, was the avian flu, right, that went through and wiped out a ton of chickens um, or hens. I think are the ones that lay eggs. You Doesn't think matter. I know about anything about animals? No, no, okay. I, I shouldn't. Um, but now that's being resolved. And so I think it's I think it's good that people have tightened their pe people, even though consumption has been resilient. I think on some goods, um, it makes sense that consumption has decreased and that that's driving deflation because it means that producers have to be accountable, mm -hmm. right? These prices can't just be raised to anything because people will cut out goods that are inflating too fast. So now it's we, we've talked about before how we don't expect the economy to go into deflation overall. Mm -hmm. But the sentiment that um, eggs are still $6 a dozen, well, maybe that doesn't have to be true. Right. Maybe our economy can still grow while the biggest, most specific pain points are dissuaged a little bit. Right. Like the big problem with deflation comes if it's also alongside weakening consumer spending. Yes. That's when deflation's bad, right? Mm -hmm. Deflation may be a sign of weakening consumer spending, but if we get through the holiday season, consumer spending is still high and we have deflation, then we've hit soft landing, baby. Yes, right? exactly. That's what that's all about. Yes. And so I was doing some research on like these different companies that model consumer behavior and Deloitte publishes their report every holiday season. Mm. What's going to happen with the consumers? How are they feeling? Well, they see that consumers are expecting to spend a lot more money than what they were last year. So um, they expect to spend, the average consumer is expected to spend $1,652 this holiday season, wow. which is a 14% year over year increase from last year. Wow. So that shows the consumer base is very, very resilient and they are excited to go out and spend money yeah that's fantastic yeah that's a really good uh thing to see from the holiday season which is also still like surprise like it's surprisingly good to me right it's not just good with student loans being like continued it's it's really impressive to me the, well the issue with the the reason that this doesn't really like it doesn't that doesn't play too much into it okay. is because they're not the the people who are paying back their student loans most notably are not the main drivers of the consumers okay they're not really the moms and dads buying their kids the toys 
Do you know what I mean? Like the 40 year olds, the the 40 year olds aren't the ones with the most amount of the student loan debt. Okay. I suppose. Um, Yeah. But yeah, so definitely good news. And I wanted to say one more thing about, we said that the personal savings rate was going down. Mm -hmm. That can be a little bit of a difficult thing to understand. You might hear that and think, oh no, is the American person not able to save as much money as they once were? Their saving rate is down. Does that mean they're not saving as much money? That might have been the case, but that would be the case if not for this other metric, the real personal savings rate. Uh, I'm sorry, the real personal overall savings. So real overall savings is twice as much what it was in 2006 while the rate of savings is lower. So people not only are saving less of their paycheck, but they have more in their savings than they did a decade ago. Hmm. Interesting. And that's why they don't feel like they need to, their savings rate can be so low because okay. they don't need to save as much anymore yeah. because they have more in their savings account. Basically, we're a rich enough economy yeah. right now that like you don't have to go... You don't have to splurge a ton of your money to feel like you have a great life. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's awesome. So yeah, consumer spending is looking good. It looks like it's going to be a very, very expansive holiday season. Um, And it it goes against a lot of our media narratives about inflation, about the economy. Um, And I think once we get through these next couple months, I think uh, consumer confidence is going to change a lot. Mm. I think it's only going to take three more months for it to really settle in. Because once we start seeing inflation numbers that are below 3%, which are just around the corner, believe it or not, it's going to be a whole different story on the news every day. Yeah, that's true. They won't be able to even pretend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Cool. Next, we have batteries. Batteries are booming, people. We have talked a lot about the green energy transition, fighting back against climate change. Um, electric vehicles and how that whole business works in the United States and the global market. Well, now batteries have seen an incredible year of growth and they're only expected to grow more. So I want to, sh- I want to talk about briefly the different types of batteries that have uh, been created in each uh, major decade and their general overall capacity here. So, um, uh, In the 1900s, the best type of battery was a lead acid battery. It had about 25 uh, watts per kilogram. Today, so then I want to go over to 2000s, okay? In the 2000s, we developed a lithium ion battery. That was the best battery we could have. And it was around 350 watts per kilogram. Today, in the 2020s, we have the solid state battery, which is at 550 watts per kilogram. We are seeing massive exponential growth in the efficiency of our batteries, yeah. which is leading to more and more things be able to be powered by batteries. Mm-hmm. First, it was electronics, then cars, then light trucks, now heavy trucks, and eventually they uh, projected to go on to short haul air, short haul airplanes will be able to be powered with this solid state battery type, and then probably long haul eventually. I think this reminds me of when we did the deep dive on tech on climate change technologies, and we talked about learning curves for different things like solar and wind power and how um, how the costs got lower and lower the more we use them. Well, obviously, the more we use these technologies, the efficiency also gets better and better. And so that's where we're seeing this exponential curve that is um, that is hitting the levels of efficiency we need right when we need it. To. Exactly. And this, this is a really interesting uh, metric, the improvement rate of batteries. Mm. So the way that this company, RMI, is where I found this study, the way that they measure the improvement rate is the relationship between the total energy, energy density between the top performing battery and the number of batteries that are accessible on the market that are currently in use. Mm. So right, we have gone from an improvement rate of around 7% between 1993 and 2020. Um, That has been the average improvement rate. 2023, we've shot up to an 18% improvement rate, which is just a doubling of our capacity um, or our growth capacity, which is just awesome. If we can continue that trend, batteries are just going to be everywhere very, very fast. Yeah, and batteries, I was thinking about this earlier this week. Batteries are so, like... I can't even articulate how important they are, especially when we have the main problem of a, uh, a an economy that's powered by clean energy being it, intermittency, right? Where right. the sun doesn't always shine, wind doesn't always blow. So if those are our sources of energy, how do we make sure that people can get power whenever they want? Batteries, that's the answer. And the more efficient batteries get, 
and the longer they can store energy, the less, the, the more easily we can phase out fossil fuels because we don't have to worry about that intermittency problem. Yeah, and the demand for batteries is only increasing. We saw a 25% demand for batteries increase, mostly in the passenger EV space, but also in the commercial EV space. It was almost a 50% increase in the commercial EV uh, oh. Uh, yeah, the commercial EV demand. In top of, on top of that, we also see a tripling of the store of the of the stationary storage demand, which is really really awesome because that's what we're talking about. Yeah. that's holding in that solar for that cloudy day. Yeah, that's what that is. That oh. stationary storage, and that's just year over year. And that's, that's just year over year. Demand. Yes, Holy a cow. year over year tripling of demand. Oh, unbelievable! That's fantastic. And every year they update their projections, so. We have not only exceeded the 2018 projections of battery uh, of lithium ion battery demand, 2019, the 2020, the 21 estimate, the 22 estimate, our 2023 estimate is now um, triple what it was in 2018. Yeah. The, the industry has totally upscaled masterfully. Yeah. Fantastic. And it's, only, and it's only growing more with the Inflation Reduction Act. We see, the, honestly, parts of the South, Georgia, are becoming the battery belt. Yeah. Where they're just making batteries like crazy down there. Yeah. It's fantastic. A, a lot of the, the red states are the ones that are going to benefit from the most from this, that are going to have the renewable energies um, powering them before even a lot of the blue states just because of where they're located, mm -hmm. right? That's where more of the sun is. That's where they have more of the space so they can develop these huge plants. Yeah. And the United States is increasing their uh, installed battery manufacturing capacity rapidly. Again, if we look at if look at figure five, mm -hmm. it's a tripling of the installed battery manufacturing capacity in the United States yeah. between 2022 and 2023. One year, a tripling of our manufacturing capacity. China still has a massive a massive amount of the market uh, yeah like it's not even close we're looking at 80 percent of the market they have maybe a little bit more but china's growth is going to be harder the larger and larger it gets right now true america's growth right now this is our time to grow true like we're about to hit our exponential boom if the Inflation Reduction Act does what it's supposed to do. Yeah, which I expected to because of the restrictions it's going to put on Chinese technology. Exactly. We're going to be forced to onshore some of that production. Exactly. Um, actually, in 2023, I think installed battery manufacturing capacity will be equal in the United States to that of Europe, if not the U.S. a little bit more, mm. when just the year prior, Europe was more than the United States. Yeah, Europe had like doubled the capacity that we, we had. It just shows that the United States is taking this seriously yes and we've chosen to do this with a planned industrial policy mm -hmm. um now there is one area where the united states sucks and that is uh doing the resource mining processing um and genuinely the production yeah <laughs> um mining zero None of it's done in the United States, literally none of it, no. which is fine because a lot of it is done by our, our allies, except for graphite. Graphite is wholly controlled by China on the international market, mm. which means that we are wholly reliant on them. Then when we get into the processing, pretty much all of it is controlled by China. Yeah. Some of it is in Europe, but mostly China. Yeah. And we need to decouple that and find friends who can do this same process efficiently. And then, you know. Production is all China pretty much too. Yeah. Production it, is the only place where we have a little bit of a share in batteries and EVs. Yeah. Um, but it, the anodes and batteries and EVs are nothing if you can't make the anodes and the cathodes, which all come from China, right? True. So if, I mean, well, if you don't have the cathodes and anodes, which oh, do all come from China right yeah. now, it's, it's a hard, it's really a tough dilemma because we are a service economy and we're too rich to transition to a, a mining and like, a yes. hardcore manufacturing economy. Right. We're not going down the value chain here. We're not going to do that. Yeah. So it really, it to me, it seems like something where it let's, let's give Mexico a ton of money to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It, it just, it doesn't match our education. In the, I'm not saying that we can't do it. I'm saying that we are educating people at a level where they don't, they won't want to. So even if we think that we have the people to supply these industries, they're not going to want to work in those industries. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing that I really love to see is that we have the mineral capacity to get all of these things done. Mm. So if we, for the demand to reach our net zero goals, um, we have all the cobalt necessary by 2020, through 2028. Same with graphite, same with lithium, a little bit behind on nickel. But this is just with our current 
supply that is announced. This isn't this isn't taking into account the supply scenarios that could change in the next two to three years. Yeah. Right. Which means that we, we will probably super exceed the amount of nickel that we need to meet our net zero demands. Yeah. That, so it, it, it makes me happy to see all the pieces are there. We just have need to have the political will to put them all together. Yeah. And I think even that's there now, right? With something like the IRA and it's this is top of mind for every country. Yeah. Everyone is talking about this. Everyone is talking about the green transition. Um so yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. I'm purely optimistic right now. I mean, I'm not purely optimistic. I'm still terrified and, and worried that it's too little too late. But <laughs> at, this is this does seem to be like about the most we could be doing right yeah. now. Yeah. Like, well, listen, we lost the decade of the 2010s. We should have done more in the 2010s. The mm-hmm. whole world should have done more in the 2010s. Mm-hmm. We absolutely we had the era of low interest rates. We'll talk about that in a second in regards to solar energy. We absolutely should have done more to invest then. We're a little late. But since we're investing now, this is what we should be doing at this moment. And yeah. we're doing the right things. Yes, we are. So batteries are booming and solar just keeps on chugging. The United States is expected to... Oh, do you want to cut that a little bit so it's easier to chop up for the YouTube video? Um, no, I think you were fine. Oh, and then, I, then I, now I really just fucked it up. Oops. Whatever. Um, this is why they love us. Yeah. Silly moments like this. <laughs> Because we're real, guys. We're real. We're just silly, goofy dudes. Yeah. So solar keeps on chugging. The United States is expected to add 33 gigawatts of production capacity. This is 55% growth compared with the capacity of 2022. That's fantastic. That is just unreal. In quarter three, 2023, the United States solar market installed 6.5 gigawatts. Oh, you know what? I'm actually not a scientist and I actually don't know what that means, but it installed a lot more than what it did the previous year. <laughs> Let's stick with that. <laughs> Let's stick with that. Yeah. Making, we're getting a lot more energy from the sun. Yeah. Um, and in 2023, this is this is so amazing. Um, new U.S. electricity generation capacity addition. So 48% of all U.S. Elect- electricity generation capacity. So as we were saying, 48% of n- all new electricity generation is coming from solar. 24% of all new energy additions are coming from natural gas and coal isn't even on the list coal Mm -hmm. hasn't been on the list since 2013 and that kind of surprised me because obviously i know we're transitioning away from coal and we have been for a long time and i get that but our political conversation still mentions coal yeah right you still hear trump going out on the stoop talking about coal and helping out the coal miners and burning all the coal vivek ramaswamy getting on the stage saying that we need to burn a bunch of coal Nobody in the market is burning coal. No. I mean, Nobody. I mean, they are burning coal, but we're, yes. they're not building any new coal production because it's been clear where this market is going for 10 years now. Yeah. And so a lot of the United States reduction in carbon emissions has come from the transition from coal to natural gas, mm. which was very beneficial in the 2010s of reducing our overall CO2 emissions. But now we can see a very, very clear shift from natural gas to solar and wind in the 2020s. Mm -hmm. A massive shift. 57% of all new electricity in 2018 was natural gas. This year it was 24%. 50% reduction on that. That's insane. That's awesome. And it just shows that natural gas, for all the shit it got, rightfully so, it really was a transition of fuel. Yeah. It really was. Yes. It's a... Never mind. Let's move on. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Um, We are... uh, We... Uh, industry experts expect us to see a slowdown in 2024 in the growth of the solar industry, specifically because of the rising interest rates. Um, but this slowdown in solar adoption will mainly come from residential solar installations, not so much the commercial side. Okay. Um, Northeast California um, has done a lot in purchasing residential solar panels, and they have basically kept the consumption growth above zero percent they are really carrying their weight but the sunbelt arizona texas the adoption rate of solar residentially is not increasing and kind of decreasing year over year Mm -hmm. so in 2024 the adoption rate will sink to by 12 percent which Mm -hmm. is unfortunate to see but it's because of the rising interest rates and the cost that it's putting on consumers too high a lot of the appeal of solar panels was like We'll do it for zero dollars down, and you can pay over forty years. And yeah, you know, it, yeah, that's... and then it's cheaper energy than what you've been paying for before. Right, but if your interest rates go higher, it's no longer cheaper. Yes, um, but I also think this 
like I don't want to over exaggerate that at all because commercial solar adoption is where more of the emissions are done. Exactly. Right. So that's much more important if that if adoption there will be continuing to grow. Right. And it will be continuing to grow. The adoption of utilities, which is really where most of our energy consumption comes from, mm-hmm. is all um, coming from is all increasing in their solar production yeah. utilities are increasing every year and expected to increase every year until 2028 yeah that's the that's what the estimates say and that's really awesome so again even if the residential consumption goes down in 2024 it's still expected to increase in 2025 and beyond non-residential it's never expected to slow down at all but the utilities is where most of our inf- uh, our most of our emissions come from anyway so that's the big problem yeah definitely that's so, super exciting yeah solar is on the rise solar is for real and Again, this in combination with the batteries, what we just talked about, the amount of batteries that are being sold specifically or the demand for batteries that are specifically for solitary storage, right? That's what these utility companies are using these batteries for. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it all goes together. And it's the more solar that's installed, I feel like the more that will be, the the easier and cheaper it will be to install it because mm-hmm. we're going to be moving away from that older infrastructure that's based on coal and natural gas. Yes, absolutely. All right, now let's switch over to what's going on in Argentina, a little Ooh. bit of foreign policy. This is just, this has been a wild ride. Yeah. We have been talking about the Argentina elections and uh, Javier Malay for so long, and now we actually get to see what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. So he gave his uh, maiden speech um, after he was inaugurated about a week ago, and he said that the country is going to go into economic shock treatment. And he made it explicitly clear. And he made it explicitly clear that there is going to be short-term pain for long-term gain. But he made it very, very clear, and he leveled with everybody that there will be pain in the short short term, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is because of his plans for dollarization. He wants to delete the Argentinian peso, totally get rid of it, and exchange all those pesos for dollars. Now, this causes a lot of issues. It's expensive. They don't have the cash on hand, all these things. But they also need to be able to exchange everyone's pesos for dollars. Well, right now, the official exchange rate is around was around 400, 400 pesos to every one U.S. dollar. That's too expensive. The Argentinian government can't afford that. There's no way. So one of the first moves of his economy minister will be to move the exchange rate from 400 pesos to 800 pesos to equal to one dollar. I need you to help me with something uh-huh. because I, I suddenly lose every shred of my intelligence when I start thinking about exchange rates. Why? I don't know. But, <laughs> w- okay, you're saying one US dollar will now buy 800 pesos. Or mm-hmm. in other words, he's trying to dollarize. So for, for Malay and the Argentinian government, 800 pesos will buy one dollar. Yes. Why would he want that rather than 400 pesos buying one dollar? Because 400 pesos for $1, wait, hold on. Now you got me confused. Exactly, because 400 pesos for $1 means 800 pesos buys $2. No, that means that means Malay has to give out less dollars to people. Oh. The Argentinian government has to pay out less dollars. So he gets to keep buying pesos. The government buys, or buys dollars at 400 pesos. But since... But the people, the Argentinian... No, no, no. So the Argentinian government is going to be buying dollars for whatever exchange rate the United States gives them. Which is 400. I don't know. No, that's not not something that's dictated by the government. This 400 exchange rate is to what's there for the Argentinian people. The what, how you buy dollars on the market is going to be some floating thing, like a, like buying a, like a security. Yeah. But I'm just assuming where you're saying previously it was 400 pesos to one. That's, that is where the floating rate was around. No. So the Argentina rate for the people was $400 per one peso that is set with government policy. Okay. So now they're saying the government policy is 800 to one. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm curious. Um, so I'm seeing, Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing one peso, or yeah, I'm seeing the 800 to one rate as well on the international market for. Yeah, but I'm get, but I think that's just because of Malay's, um, yes. policy. Yes. So, so it's a little confusing, it. obviously, but yeah. this is this is what's available. So right now, this is exactly what he's talking about with initial pain for eventually, hopefully, long term gain here, because right now everyone just lost half their wealth. Yeah. 
everyone just lost half their wealth. End of story. It's, that's absolutely insane. Could you imagine to think about. saving your whole life and just in an instant, half your money's gone? Absolutely insane. I, I just can't. But now, one of one of the reasons Malay is doing this, and he, he seems it's so apt to do so, obviously it makes dollariz- dollarizing cheaper for him. Mm-hmm. Um, it also brings the official rate closer to the black market rate. The black market rate is reportedly to be 1,000 to 1. So people are like trading on the streets 1,000 peso to $1. So it's like dollars are actually more valuable than yes. what the government has set the rate at. Dollars are more valuable than what the government has set the rate at. That's right. So he's trying to make it closer to what's happening on the black market. Yeah. But he also doesn't want people to use the black market. That's kind of the plan. Right? Yeah. He doesn't want to He doesn't want to make mm. it too high where everyone loses all their wealth. And he doesn't want to make it too low that dollarizing is too expensive. And he doesn't want to make it far too low that people still go to the black market. Yeah. So it's very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, now, uh, dozens of economists have warned that dollarizing Argentina's economy risks worsening inflation. Wow. Um, some economists say that since the country does not have a large stock of foreign currency, they will need to lower the exchange rates even lower. This is exactly what we're talking about. Okay. They're saying that they might have to go even lower, which is going to hurt home buyers and obviously the working class who has saved any money at all. Yeah. Um, they also say that Argentina might have to take out a loan from the IMF to get the dollars. <laughs> Which is exactly what it's trying to avoid. Right, which is exactly what it's trying to avoid. Yeah. So the IMF, Argentina is currently the largest debtor to the IMF. They okay. owe the IMF more money than any other nation on the planet. They own yeah. $31.1 billion. They took out a, a loan of $40 billion around uh, a decade ago or something like that. And now they want to maybe take out more money in order to fund the dollarization. I, I want to get, I'm going to stick on something again. Sure. So dozens of economists warned that dollarizing argentina's economy risks worsening inflation yes why is that well because we just saw people's money is now half of what it was yeah but that's isn't that the problem it's like people now have so much less money so why would prices be driven higher wouldn't deflation be the risk Hmm. hold on no prices now have to increase to accommodate the for the f- dollar um, no, hold on. So this is this is even before the dollar gets into the country. Okay. This is before the dollar gets into the country. They're saying as the rate of exchange from 400 goes to 800, okay. inflation goes up. Okay. Uh, like that makes sense, right? Sure. Because now your money is worth half of what it was. Yes. So the, lo- the short-term impacts to inflation, the economists are saying, is going to be insane. Mm-hmm. Once the switch happens, inflation is going to be tied to production and the U.S. Fed policy. Yes. Right? Okay. That's it. Good. But up until then, everything's up in the air. Yeah. All okay. hell breaks loose. All yeah. hell breaks loose. Yeah. And now there are political struggles going on as he doesn't necessarily know if he has all the votes necessary to pass a dollarization campaign. Um, his party does not have control of Congress, but the center-right party has control of one Congress and the Peronist center-left government has control of the Senate equivalent in Argentina, something similar to that uh, things going on, basically a divided house. Mm -hmm. Um, So it would take a lot of political maneuvering for him to be able to do this. Now, on top of dollarizing the economy, shifting the exchange rates, he's also shrinking the size of government. He has half the number of federal ministries. I've read that it it has gone from 18 ministries to nine. I've also read that it's gone from 21 to nine. I think there are three industries that people don't necessarily count, like the like the um, diversity ministry or the art department. I don't know if they include that. And the point is, he's halving the size of government, period. He's combining the transportation, mining, health, and other related departments into the Department of Human Capital, which I think says a lot about his mindset. <laughs> How so? Um, the people, people's health, um, the mining industry, it's all about human capital. Yeah. It's right. It's not, it's not How human. How can we utilize you for our economy? Yeah. 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 It, says, it says a lot about him. He is a right wing economist, so it makes sense. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. He's cutting federal support to all individual states by like 40%. Mm. So all money that goes into state governments from the federal government of Argentina is going to be basically cut in half or near so. And he wants to totally privatize the infrastructure system. Um, 
we can we have our disagreements on this show about privatization versus nationalization but one of the things that are really bad about private like the worst case scenario of privatization is when you can't have competition and i can't think of a more non-competitive industry than railroads yeah i agree <laughs> i agree that's scary right um the scariest part about malay is his crackdown of dissent. And I think this is important to put in context. Malay advertised himself as a libertarian, fighting for freedom, talking about don't tread on me, like flying don't tread on me flags um, on, at, at his political rallies. But he's cracking down on dissent in a way that you would only expect from an authoritarian tyrant. Um, he is saying that he is going to pass a measure that protesting individuals and organizations will be identified with vid video and digital manual and, and digital means, basically the way China does um, to crack down on their protests. And all of those individual people are going to be billed directly for all security forces that police these demonstrations. That's insanity that's going to completely eliminate the right to protest yeah and uh, overnight your right to protest is totally gone yeah because that means if you don't have any money you can't protest mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. crazy um one leftist legislator um said that what they announced what this what their party announced is unconstitutional and the right to protest is the first of all rights well jose luis esper a, a legislator under malay's party liberty advances replied with a three words three words he replied with prison or bullet oof this is not libertarianism dude mm. this mm -mm. is not about liberty this no. is the opposite of liberty this is market tyranny yeah. that's what this is this is capitalist dictatorship classic classic pinochet chilean government style right here man yeah this is wild this is getting worse and worse police will be able to confiscate all face masks sticks and signs at train stations to halt protests and this is all coming when protests are obviously going to be inevitable he's prepping for this he's he's purposefully going to drive the economy into the crapper for about a year that's what he's admitting he's like we're going into shock therapy we all know that he's getting people to ready saying that Things are going to get a lot worse very fast. He's going to cut public sector wages. He's going to change. He's going to raise the inflation rate by fifty percent. We know all this. Now it's all going to be about how he can calm the the people who are angry at him for his decisions. Yeah, and it's going to be either prison or bullet. Yeah, I think this is one of the worst things the government can do. Probably the worst thing they can do. Protesting is a manner of speech, right? It's a mode of communication and to infringe upon that makes people suddenly scared to not only say certain things but think certain things and that's the worst place that you can possibly exist dissent is where the best ideas flourish yeah right dissent is where good ideas get created yeah. when you crack down on dissent you crack down on innovation you crack down on your flexibility uh, you destroy your national spirit yeah well that's it that's on a systemic level and just on the individual level it's so demoralizing it hurts like to know you're in this place where you you're necessarily constrained even if you can go out and walk down the street right mm -hmm. it's totally right it's a fake type of liberty yeah um and again this is this is so this is so i think important to understand that free markets doesn't mean freedom they are not the same thing malay wants to create an anarcho-capitalist dream where the market rules everything except for when you're angry about how much you get paid, yeah. except for when you're unhappy with how the transportation is, is, is controlled, except for when you're upset with the government's decision about abortion rights or something. Mm -hmm. Then it's no longer freedom. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Last current event we have here is last piece of foreign policy. We have stuff going on, uh, developments with the Palestine-Israeli conflict. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of an offshoot of what's happening in Gaza in that recently the Houthis in Yemen, which are kind of a, a militant group terrorist organization, which are backed by Iran, have been firing missiles and attacking with drones ships that are going through the Red Sea and specifically the Suez Canal. So about 12% of all shipping is done through the Suez Canal every year. It's the fastest route from Europe and Africa into Asia. Um, but the Houthis, in protest of Israel's bombing of Gaza, have been attacking ships that have gone through there now. So this is massively interrupting trade. 
Already 12 major shipper, shipping companies have announced that they are stopping shipments through the canal and instead is routing them around Cape Horn oh. at the southern tip of Africa, which adds weeks to the duration of these trips and, of course, a lot of cost to them as well. Right. The inefficiency is insane not going through the Suez Canal. Yeah, it's it's terrible. Um, so today, the U.S. launched a multinational operation to protect shipping companies going through the canal. The U.S. Navy has already been in the Red Sea attempting to shoot down whatever Houthi missiles and drones it sees coming in, um, but they don't have the capacity on their own to cover all of the area that they want to. And so Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said that the U.K., Bahrain, Canada, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Seychelles, and Spain would all participate in the program, which is... A very good sign. Um, it's not clear if they'll act the same way as the U.S., um, but they are going to be helping in some way at least. It's interesting that you said that it doesn't seem like we have the resources necessary to cover the whole shipping route. I think we don't talk enough about the inefficiencies in the U.S. military. I shouldn't say inefficiencies, but the lack of ability that we do have. We see, we think about the U.S. military as this overall behemoth super superhero that can do everything, um, and it honestly can't. There, we we should do a deep dive on this. I think I would like to because I think it. We have a large de uh, deficit in the amount of guns we produce, in the amount mm. of artillery shells we produce, in our overall artillery capacity. Even if we were to ramp it up, we have large deficits in this. And now we see that the United States now needs to work with other countries more than it had to even two decades ago to secure peace and security in certain regions of the globe yeah we've been we've been pulling back and part of that has been consciously right, right? because it's going to be less in our interest to patrol the global seas um and and of course we're spread thin right now right we've been trying to aid ukraine in their war we've been supplying israel in their assault of gaza not to mention we're constantly um running uh, running FANOPs in the South China Sea drills to try to establish the freedom of navigation there while China is trying to claim the whole South China Sea as its own and encroaching upon the exclusive economic zones of other countries in the region. So we're just we're needed in too many places right now to be able to assist every region to the fullest of our capacity. And I like that the United States looks like they're working more with their partners than they did in the past mm. like we're making a decisive effort to be like hey can like let's let's have you guys cover this section you guys cover this section and it looks like they're trying to rope the national security of the world and into a larger mosaic of nations rather than just have the u.s at it alone like think about the war in iraq was like really just the united states and and the uk right all of europe didn't follow us mm -hmm. for rightful reasons but the point is it looks like america has more of a reason and a more desire to paint that mosaic picture of national and international security than it did two decades ago yeah and i wonder how much of that is a strategic um plan on their part not only to paint the picture but also to go to their allies and say hey we are too stretched legitimately we can't just go do this all on our own we need some of your ships to come in and help us patrol yeah yeah the one other point i'll make is oil prices are already rising because of the situation because of the length of the shipping routes and that's a very kind of detached way to look at it i think but this did get me thinking about how when when the prices rise for these basic necessities for fuel that creates our energy those those prices are they burden the people at the lowest end of the economic spectrum the most for sure so if this if this initiative can help more oil go through the Suez Canal and be delivered much more cheaply than it is when it goes around the Cape or when it goes around Cape Horn, I'm on board. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think like, yeah, I don't want to make this too, this is so gross econo like, yeah. economy bro of me. Yeah. But like, oh God, it's going to hurt our inflation report next month. 
right? Like, are you serious? Like, we ju- we are just rounding the corner. Yeah. As I'm saying this, like December, January, February last year was some of the worst months. If we can get the average down on those months this year, oh man, we'll be chilling. If this causes oil prices to rise, kiss that out the window. No, it, it's I, I hear you, and even past the U.S., there were concerns reported on in this article about or from the global community about global inflation yeah. being restarted because of this. Yeah. So I certainly hope not. Totally unacceptable. You cannot in- interfere with global trade like this. Yeah. Absolutely not. Deep dive time, everybody. Yeah. We are going to be talking about the German economy in the post-World War II, post-Cold War age, how we got to where it is now, the booms, their busts, and their current dilemmas. Absolutely. So let's start from the end of World War II. Um with the Nazi-controlled government, there were a lot of privatization schemes and state interventions. There were implementations of certain price controls. There were government-directed contracts. There were a lot of state interventions in the economy. Um, there were the complete abandonment of trade unions entirely in the Nazi government. So there was a lot of mixed uh, economic models going on in the Nazi regime. A, l- a lot of people describe it, historians will describe it as basically the Nazis doing whatever it did to keep the party in power. There was really no ideological cohesion to their economic policy. It was just what was going to make them the most empowered. Mm-hmm. So after the fall of Nazi Germany, basically German industrial output bottoms out, right? Drops by 50%, some crazy numbers. And they need to start the process of rebuilding. Now, for the purposes of this analysis, I'm going to sp- speak mostly towards West Germany because that's where the most of the interesting political infighting takes place. Mm. And so there are two different models of economic development post the Nazi age. There is the social democratic element there, which is emphasizing economic democracy. And then there's the more liberal, liberal, neoliberal uh, path towards the social conscious free market. And these are the two individual um, ideological sides and economic modes that the country will be choosing to go down the path of. So this is the SPD's program of economic democracy. They wanted a decentralized planning system that was held together through public ownership of major industries and heavy industries um, with an equal influence of of unions um, on corporate bodies. Okay. And to be clear, SPD is like the current center left, left leaning political party in Germany. Yes. Yes. That is the that is the social democratic party of Germany. Right. That is the. Yeah. So that's the SPD. Um, this was building off of an international consensus, right? They saw what was going on with the, in the U.S. with the New Deal and the expansion of the welfare state and union rights. Mm-hmm. They saw what was going on in the United Kingdom with the labor government of George Clemenceau. Uh, George Clemenceau? No, that was a French prime minister. Um, Brennan Attlee. Attlee um, was the prime minister after Winston Churchill. Okay. So Attlee was the creation of the National Health Service. You saw these massive expansions of of state intervention in the economy, and the SPD wanted to carry that into Germany. Um, They wanted to focus mainly on full employment. That was the SPD's focus. They were focusing on full employment, and they were going to be okay with getting this through state interventions and state directions. Mm -hmm. Um, This was supported, this mode was supported by the UK, most Americans, unions, and honestly, some manufacturing leaders in the company as well. They also wanted to continue with the price controls developed in the end stages of the Weimar Republic that were kept going through the Nazi age. Interesting. And they wanted to, and but this was despite failures in that already being seen, right? They, they knew that a black market was developing because of these price controls, okay. but they wanted to power through that with hopefully an increase in production, which would balance out the pricing. So they wanted to keep price controls because they didn't want prices and thus revenue that they could use as wages to be dictated by competition and of how productive companies could become is that your understanding well they didn't want price controls because they didn't want the working class to get priced out of necessary goods they would have they prefer a queue system of waiting online to get that good at that price rather than just chasing after the price of whatever it floats to. Okay, rather than letting demand drive supply up. Yeah. Okay, so that's were, so black market prices were higher. Yes, they were going to do they were going to do state intervention to get production up. Okay. Right? They didn't want to do the demand incentivized production up of okay. prices going up. Sure. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now, the socially conscious free market was a totally different plan. Well, that's actually of historical contention, but we'll get to that. So, um 
this approach was not laissez-faire. It was not totally free market. The people who were pro-socially conscious free markets actually sometimes came from socialist backgrounds, but they were not socialist by any means. They were very much neoliberal. Mm. We, you can actually, we've talked about in our deep dive of neoliberalism, we talked about how F.A. Hayek actually came from a somewhat socialist background. Mm. And uh, he kind of in, in, uh, had some of his ideas where he was okay with a public health care system and stuff like that. Yeah. Right? So um, he he was definitely not laissez-faire. Um, he wanted government to promote competition. He wanted a strong antitrust program. Mm -hmm. the, the socially conscious free market wanted a strong um, antitrust program, and he wanted to keep the market free of monopoly, public or private. It yeah. didn't matter. Yeah, it does sound very familiar to our neoliberal conversation. It's like the it's not less state. It's use the power of the state to ensure a market and an economy that works in a way that maximizes productivity and social well-being. Yes, they also wanted to implement a graduated income tax, or not implement it, but keep it. They just wanted to cut the middle portion of the graduated income tax lower. So they wanted middle class reductions with keeping like 95% taxes on the rich. What is a graduated income tax? So graduate income tax is if you make 20,000, you pay nothing. If you pay 30,000, you pay 10. If you pay 40, if you make 40,000, you pay 20. Okay. And it goes up and up and up. Okay. So yeah. So like how we have here. How we have here. Sure. Yes. Okay. Exactly like our current taxing system. Mm -hmm. But they had 95% taxes on people making over like 200 grand okay. in Germany. Now they they cut it to like, I think it was like 45% for people making wow. over 200 grand. It's a massive cut. And then kept 95% for people making over a million or something like that. Okay. That, would, that, that was the socially conscious free market approach. Okay. Um, the plan was also to create a new currency, which rings very, very close to home with our current understanding of what's going on in Argentina. <laughs> to curb problems mm -hmm. with inflation, they wanted to scrap the currency and start over. And they wanted to focus on monetary stability over full employment. So when we talk about economics in the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve has two mandates in the United States, to have full employment and to keep the dollar stable. That is seemed to be a floating and and uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Converse relationship, uh, yeah. conflicting relationship, conflicting, yeah. conflicting relationship, inverse relationship. When one goes up, the other goes down. When one, go you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So these are the two sides of the coin, which makes a lot of sense because in our neoliberal discussion, a lot of it was John Maynard Keynes versus F. A. Hayek, and F. A. Hayek was all about the monetarist theory of inflation, mm -hmm. and then Maynard Keynes thought of everything in the terms of full employment, of get the country roaring, get production up through state intervention and deficit spending. Mm -hmm. right yeah. two different very different views mm -hmm. so the socially conscious free market side ends up winning out and they are the ones that get that gets their policy implemented and so ludwig earnhardt becomes the economy minister um and he is 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 in a coalition of other liberal parties he was in the cdu okay so now this was this is about to lead into the fastest growth that Germany has ever seen in the modern world. This is about to be Germany's boom. And a lot of historical debate and a lot of historical arguments center around what caused this boom? What caused the quote unquote German miracle? Mm -hmm. That is a question that historians and economists have been trying to answer forever. And I'm going to give you both sides of that argument and kind of where I land on it at the end. So just to, just to summarize here, Earnhardt, when he gets into power, he does. I want to go over what he does. Three major things. He does the currency law of 1948. He scraps the currency, gets rid of another one. He exchanges um, 100 old Deutschmarks for six and a half new Deutschmarks. So 100 to six and a half, mm. okay? He gave economic authorities to take the necessary measures in the field of control and to determine in detail which goods and production should be freed from price controls. So he basically dropped a lot of price controls. Notably, he didn't drop all price controls. He kept rent controls and he kept agricultural product controls. So okay. he kept food, he kept food price controls, and he kept rent controls in place. But he got rid of the other ones. Okay. Um, actually, he didn't, he didn't get rid of coal either, but I'll get into that in a second. But the most important part about his government and his legacy and the overall, fan I shouldn't say fantasy, but the folklore conception of the German miracle really boils down to this last bullet. 
He consistently balanced budgets through the entire reform period. And a lot of the German miracle is tied to that belief and that understanding that the budgets were balanced when Germany's growth was high. Mm. That was a fundamental ideological goal and like uh, basis for movements to come around monetarist and neoliberal policy going forward. Yeah, and we've already talked about, obviously, this is an ex extremely important thing to remember because in the recent conversations we've been having about Germany, it is all, all of their thoughts about what to do for their economy have this underlying basis of we need to stay fiscally sound and responsible as far as having a balanced budget and not taking on too much debt. Exactly. And it comes from Erhard in this 1948 reform period. So now let's look at the economic growth for this time period. In the time of the German production boom, 1948 to 1960, their average growth rate was 8.2%. Um, from wow. 1960 to 1970, it was 4.4. Okay. So we saw a 50% reduction after this decade. And then 1970 to 1880, it goes down to 2.9. You said 1880. What? 1970 to 1980. Yeah. yeah. 1980 to 1990, 2.6, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes down to averaging about 1% growth. Yeah. So this was the boom period. And people want to understand why this boom happened. Why did the... Why did this boom happen? If the SPD won out, would this boom have happened? Mm. If economic democracy happened in West Germany, would the same growth have happened? That's a question that economists have been trying to answer forever. Yeah. Was the balanced budget, like, did it, does it deserve as much credit as it gets for exactly. fueling the economy? Exactly. Was that the main reason? Yeah. So I want to go into one study that was done by the Cato Institute to begin this analysis. So the Cato Institute is a right-leaning organization for sure. They Very are, libertarian. They are libertarian to their core, and they are big proponents of the German miracle. They talk about the German miracle in regards to a bunch of a bunch of countries that are struggling. I've seen um, an article comparing um, the current situation in Argentina, saying that they need. Uh, a German miracle. Mm. So this is very, very prominent in people's minds here. So it's important how we understand what happened. So Cato Institute, um, they tried to identify how much of the production was because of A, the reforms that were taking place, or B, the general shock of output that happens after war. So keep in mind, half of Germany was just totally destroyed during the war, right? So how much of the initial or the growth of real income was because of the reforms and how much was because of the recovering from the wartime period? So to do this, they plotted Germany's real per capita income from 1840 up to 2000. Mm. They plotted that. And now they want to see where was the trend bucked. Well, you can see the trend bucked at World War I and World War II. Large declines and then increases afterwards. So what they needed to do was they needed to build a model that was going to um, basically just track the trend of time, but account for the years that were shocking to the trend. Okay. So they built a model that was just going to be almost like a moving average model, but slightly more sophisticated. It's called um, an autoregressive model. If any of you have studied statistics out there, you'll know what that means. It's an autoregression model with specific years of importance. So it has like the years of World War I, the year of 1924 hyperinflation. It has the years of World War II. And then after accounting for all those years, um, ben, if you could go to page 17 for me and look at the chart at the top of the page, I want you to see that. So plot A is what you would have expected to see if there was no shock times, and plot B is what happened in real life. So we see a slight increase in the years of 1940 to 1950, but it's very, very minuscule. It's genuinely minuscule. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, well... Yeah, in 40 to 50, but the rate of growth that... So then you have 50 to 60, where the rate of growth from 50 to 60 completely compensates for the shock of the war and gets back exactly to the proposed, to the expected path that would have happened without shocks. Exactly. And that so now the Cato Institute, but th th that's not the conclusion they draw from this. Okay. The Cato Institute looks at the residual plot, which you can see is the next one below. Re again sophomore stats class people in college get on it all right um 
you can see an increase in the rate of change in the 40s and 50s. There's no doubt. But we're talking about 0.01, 0.02 increases in the residuals here. Yeah. Very, very small. Yeah. Very, very small deviations from the mean. Um, but the Cato Institute concludes this. There, they conclude that there was a growth bonus of approximately 1.5%, which fades into the 1970s. So they conclude that there is strong evidence for a second growth enhancing besides the temporary for except for the reconstruction effect. Yeah. So they're concluding that the reforms accounted for 1.5% more a growth in the 1940s and fit into the 1940s, which doesn't seem like a lot to me. No. Um, but not not when you're growing at a rate of 8%. Right. Not when you're growing at a rate of 8%. It doesn't seem like that. So there's another side to this. So we have the Cato Institute to summarize Cato Institute believes that 1.5% of production is specifically caused by the German balanced budget, by the removal of price controls, and by the currency change. Now we have a different view. This was written by uh, Barry Eichengreen and Albrecht Lichtel from the London School of Economics. Um, they, they propose that there are three fundamental reasons why the German economy grew fast in the 50s and 60s. They have believed, one, that workers were becoming more productive as workers were moving from an agricultural economy into an industrial economy. Um, Britain, which they compare Germany to throughout this period, um, was already in their industrial period. They moved everybody away from low productivity agriculture. Germany hasn't done that yet. So this is Germany moving from low productivity agriculture into industry. They say that structural liberal reforms may have ignited an economic growth potential. That is the, uh, that is the second that they propose. And then the third is the general reconstruction effect. The reconstruction effect is the rebuilding after wartime. So I want to briefly go through each one of these. Won't be long. And then we can talk about um, what our conclusions are from this. So workers, um, let's start with the worker productivity analysis. Workers were becoming more productive as they were moving from agriculture into industry. GD, German GDP per man hour was never as much as 75% of British GDP man hour at any point before the 1950s, but it eventually converged to the same British levels in the 1960s. So it's Germany playing catch up to where Britain already was. Okay. Right? So that's one. Then Germany inherited a very large agricultural sector that was dominated by unproductive family farmers. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of people ready to move into industry. So between 1950 and 1960, the share of the labor force outside of agriculture rose at an annual rate of 1.1%. This is much faster than other productive economies like France or the United Kingdom. Okay. Um, this, But they say that this can only account for an additional 0.73% of annual GDP growth, which is a very small percentage of the overall 8% average. So they're only able to account for 0.73% of annual GDP growth with this analysis. Okay. Right? So it's a yeah. small sliver. A sliver, but it's a small one. Mm -hmm. It's a definitely a part of the picture. Okay. So then I want to go to the reconstruction effect. The reconstruction effect is very, very simple to understand. Very, very simple. Did you rebuild what you had after the war? Mm. And so GDP in the three zones of allied occupied forces um, of the Federal Republic they were only 64% of the 1938 levels in 1948. Wow. So they had a massive amount to catch right back up on, mm -hmm. a massive amount to rebound back to. Um, and so that basically goes to show how much growth potential was really already there prior anybody even put their hands on the scale. Yeah. Before anybody did anything, it's like, Okay, basically you have 36 percentage points of GDP that's going to come bouncing right back very quick. Exactly. It's like as soon as we're not being bombed, we can get out there and get this work done. Exactly. So now they, call, they go into the main argument. Did the structural liberal reforms impact the GDP growth? This is the real crux of our understanding, mm -hmm. right? So they say that the long-lasting distributional coalitions that were, were dissolved after the war um, didn't actually that didn't result in a total factory productivity increase. Okay, what are you talking about? The long-standing distributional coalitions. That is the SPD that was in power for like 40 years. Okay. So the SP well, I shouldn't say that, but the SPD was in power throughout the Weimar era. Okay. The SPD had a lot of power even in the 1890s, 1900s, okay. 1910s. They had a lot of sway over the German monarchy. Okay. So distributional coalitions yes. means 
welfare state. Po- yes, politicians who are more in favor of taxing and distributing the yes. gains. So Otto von Bismarck, classic German military chancellor, okay. he creates the first like national health care insurance. Yeah. He insures every German. It's hyper conservative, but because of distributionist coalitions yeah. in the Reichstag, he was forced to make this um uh, this compromise with them. Anyway, okay. so that's kind of the point. So now they were dissolved yes. by the war and the occupation. Yes. Okay. Which and now, means... now the liberals are in power. Yes. Yes. Okay. Socialists are gone. Liberals in power now. Okay. So, but people are suggesting that maybe the changes that the liberals made weren't as intense as people say they are. Um, they say, so German political leaders at the time sold this as a complete repudiation of Nazi economics. And they wanted to show a clear break from the Nazi governing coalition and their economic interventionist policies. But they believe that much of this selling was that was just that selling, Hmm. not really all that true. They say that differences in the institutional constellation of the policies that followed from it dif- differed surprisingly little between Weimar and post-World War II Germany mm. and, in fact, between Germany and Britain. So they're saying that there really wasn't that much of a difference between German and British or German and pre-Nazi politics. Okay. Um, uh, when the ally- In the Allied-occupied zones, unions were organized along the exact same lines as they were in the 1920s with some 16 industrial unions, um, each with a corresponding employer um, association. And they also participated in the same kind of national congress. So there was like the same type of union organization that was pretty much picked right back up where Weimar left off. Okay. Right? It, yeah. Exactly where Weimar left off. After after the Nazis killed all the trade unionists that they could, they took the ones that were still alive, put them right back in power. So structurally so far, it seems like we're not really looking at much of a difference. Not, not with the unions. No. Okay. Not with the unions yet. Yeah. So now the currency devaluation. Um, this, they, the, 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 the liberals say that this devaluation saw a striking reduction in German working purchasing power, which result, oh, sorry, hold on. So they say that the reduction in working purchasing power helped keep prices low and stave off inflation for a while. Okay. Now, wow. What the direct initial result of this was a massive devaluation in their purchasing power actually resulted in a lot of strikes and a lot of unemployment. Okay. And this rise in unemployment, this rise in strikes, almost push, pushed Earnhardt to make a Keynesian jobs program to keep the people who were unemployed from becoming revolutionary. Like a government jobs guarantee. Like a government jobs guarantee, something like it. Okay. He never went through with it, but he thought about it. Okay. And so I think that kind of shows at least the philosophical underpinnings of the government were not a total repudiation of Keynesianism Mm -mm. because he had this idea at least in his head. Sure. Um, Now, in addition to this, in in, in guards of workers' rights, um, iron and coal, they passed the Co-Determination Act of 1951, and this act placed workers on company boards through representative elections. This allowed them to surveil their employers directly and verify that they were keeping with their investment commitments. So this is putting workers directly in between shareholders and where capital is getting placed. I can't think of a more mm, work like inter. This seems interventionist to me. Maybe not state interventionist, but certainly worker interventionist. Right. Mm. This is a very worker power move. Yeah. This is something I would like to see in the United States today. Yeah. Right. If if I could get the code determination act in the U.S., I would be very happy. Yes. Right? Yes, I'm with you. So um, they also argue, so that's all the union stuff. They also argue that the discontinuities in Germany's regulation framework didn't really change that much either. Um, And the authors argue that by today's standards, West Germany in the 1950s was still a tightly regulated economy. Um, We can see this with uh, Erhard's decisions to keep price controls in rental markets, in agricultural prices. Um, he chooses to keep these rent controls and keep all collective bargaining rights and co-deterministic relationships the same as they were in Weimar. Yeah. So that is already, okay, that's 
We have workers' rights basically around the same. Mm -hmm. We have some price controls definitely reduced, no doubt about it, but rental price controls are the same and food price controls are the same. He also passed, this is I think is super important, the Investment Aid Act of 1951. And this act imposed a levy on wide segments of German industry. And so it poured money into coal, steel, and electricity generation, and even transportation funds um, that improved their output potential. And a lot of this was because they wanted to keep the price of coal stable and coal prices were kept below cost for a long time. So to make the coal company solvent, they kept the prices of coal low, but fun funneled a lot of state money into the coal, into the coal plants. Okay. Where do they find the money to do this? The United States. A lot of this money came through the Marshall plan. And the Marshall Plan was where the United States gave Germany, Austria, a lot of these destroyed countries more money okay. so that they could build their economies back up. Mm. So Germany was keeping the price of coal low for consumers by using state subsidies to keep the industries afloat. That makes sense. Um, and a lot of, and they also argue that wage restraint was a big part of it. But a lot of unions were seeing a lot of wage increases of nine to ten percent throughout the 1950s. Okay. Um, so basically, there was not that much structural change. The currency was scrapped, and that caused short-term unemployment, short-term inflation, probably long-term stability. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I definitely think the currency change was positive for long-term stability. But I don't see anything where balanced budgets here were totally coincided with this. Mm. Or say like... A total restructuring of the economic model. Yeah, well, with the with the budget, you wonder what would have what would have what would a lot of debt have done to them? Right. I mean, less spending power for the sure. government as they start to pay back interest. That's exactly. That's so interesting. You said that because it's exactly what the argument of the authors made was the difference between British and German debt at the time period. Okay. Because so much more of British deficits. Germany had balanced budgets, but not like completely balanced. Obviously. Mm -hmm. The interest payments Britain had to pay were so much higher yeah. than interest payments Germany had to pay. So they had a lot more bang for their buck with each dollar they spent as okay. opposed to each British dollar. I think that's valid. Yeah, that's super valid. Yeah. That's hard super to argue valid. against that. No, that's a super good point. Like, yeah. It, it, yeah. But what I, I think the main thing I took from this was the German miracle is kind of a facade. I don't, I'm not convinced that the neoliberalization of, or the neoliberalization, quote unquote, of Germany was the reason we saw the 8% growth. I think it was because output was 64% of what it was in 1939. I think it was because they had a lot of people going from farm to industry. Mm. And I support this by saying a lot of the policies that Erhard continued with were not very revolutionary in their ideas. Sure. I, I, don't, I don't even know if I would look at it that way. I, I think it seems unfair to even characterize this as neoliberal, first of all, mm, the sure. way the system is described. Told, this is not neoliberal. Price controls on food and rent, that's not neoliberal at all. Collective bargaining? <sighs> exactly. Heavy unionization across the economy. Co-determinism? Workers on corporate boards? Yeah, it seems it seems silly that Cato like tries to take credit or t tries to use this as credit to the to the liberal or the neoliberal cause. Yes. Right? So First of all, I, I throw that out. I think there is credit to be given to these policies. Yes. It's just that these policies aren't neoliberal policies. Yes. And if they are, then I'm in a lot more agreement with neoliberals yeah. than I thought that Dude, I was. If this is neoliberalism, I'm a neoliberal baby. Exactly. If you're going to tell me that workers being on corporate boards is neoliberalism, sign me the F up. Yeah. Dude. So I, I, I think the policy can be applauded. And I think we, again... We talk about how we don't like massive debts for governments because of the interest they have to pay. We're talking about now how that was probably an engine for growth is that they weren't weighed down by a massive amount of debt. Yeah. So I I don't have a problem. I don't push back against that either. No. At all. So I just thought it was a really interesting to dive into. And that, that takes us into the 1960s. We have a booming, bustling West, Ger West Germany. 
East Germany, the only thing I'll say about East Germany is East Germany did see an initial spike of growth very heavy in the 1950s. There's no doubt. East Germany saw a lot of growth in the 1950s, which kind of dies off because of the whole Soviet bloc, directly planned economy, terrible economic model that mm -hmm. was Soviet communism. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but that initial spark, East Germany saw some growth back, which again makes me believe it's reconstruction effects um, okay. accounting for a lot of this. But yeah, I think I agree with you, man. A lot of this is like, maybe these policies had a lot to do with it and the policies were not neoliberal. All right, so now we're going to get into reunification post-Cold War. What has happened to the German economy since East and West Germany came back together? Um, so at the time of reunification, like Anthony just said, East Germany was doing way worse than West Germany, okay? Their GDP per capita was about 40% of that of West Germany's, and its productivity was 30%. Oh, God. Okay? Yeah, they were looking terrible. The planned economy did not go well. I, I told Anthony a kind of a funny quote was at the beginning when the two Germanys split, one of the finance ministers in East Germany said something about, like, now we'll see whether a planned economy or a privatized decentralized economy will be better we'll have a direct comparison to make and he's kind of he says something like of course the planned economy using all of the mental acuity and power of people will be more will be more effective and by the end of the cold war that's so clearly not the case Uh oh yeah so um what happened after unification this is super interesting to me first of all East Germany was in a very bad place. Part of the reason they initially built a barrier between East and West Germany and restricted immigration is because the living standards in West Germany were so much higher. So it would make a ton of sense for all of the East Germans to want to cross that border and reach the prosperity of the West on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So once, um, once the barrier falls and movement is free between each side, all instantly a ton of migration starts to happen out of East Germany into West Germany. Obviously, this hurts the economy. And the government knows that the East Germans are going to be way worse off than West Germans. Meanwhile, they have a, a specific policy that says that there should be a matter, um, some manner of equality amongst Germans, at least equality of opportunity. And so when the government when the West German government, which is, of course, who takes over the reunited Germany, when they decide what kind of policies they're going to implement, their main priority is social good, social wellness. OK, and there are some arguments that that hurt the total German economy. The first item of business was figuring out currencies. So just like we talked about um, currency, a currency change after World War II in West Germany, the West Germans had the Deutschmark, which was a strong currency, while the East had the weak Ostermark. Um, financial actors like banks wanted Ostermark holdings, the East German currency, to be transferred at a rate of two to one with the Deutschmark in order to protect the strength of the Deutschmark. Because mm. if there was a one-to-one -one transfer, they thought that there would be too many Deutschmarks in the economy and the value would be driven down. But politicians who wanted social cohesion pushed hard for that one-to-one -one transfer because, God, the protests that they would get, the protests that they got even when they were floating the idea of the two-to-one transfer were enormous. They would kind of create these two different economic classes of citizens. Well, think about those East Germans, right? Their purchasing power is cut in half in a second. Yeah, exactly. Just like we talked about with Argentina, right? Yeah, exactly the same thing. So um, so they decide mostly to do the one-to-one -one transfer. One-to-one -one conversion for cash and savings accounts. But it, there was a two-to-one conversion for corporate debts and housing loans, which makes sense, oh, right? Yeah, because good. it's like we need to cut down... Yeah the loans that are burdening the East German people. So yeah. across the board, they go for the, the social cohesion solution there. Um, meanwhile, there, the government immediately looked to privatize East German companies. So this is a super interesting like historical moment where uh, a liberalized economy takes over a nationalized one. And right. it's like, what are we going to do with all of these government-owned assets? Uh, 
they they created a government institution to handle what they were going to do with all of these this land and these East German companies. Uh, and the solution really wasn't going to be pretty. There was no way to make it great. A lot of these East German companies just were it was there were no way that they were going to be viable in the free market no. right so instant and and west germany really quite urgently wants to have them integrated into the free market they don't want to have to hold up these skeleton companies so what happened was about a third of east german companies were deemed unviable and they were liquidated wow. okay yeah so the result of that of course, is a spike of unemployment because all those companies that were just liquidated, ha all of those workers are now out of a job. Um, and as a matter of fact, even more than a third of the East German companies were unviable, but the government let private investors try again in an attempt to prioritize social good in the East to have unemployment not so, so low. And even then, it still did get so, so low. Um, and of course, even though since or one of the reasons the East Germans couldn't compete is because now they have to compete with the West Germans who have been competing in the free market for so long um, and have gotten a quality of life, a GDP per capita and productivity that's way, way higher than the East Germans. Um, so where am I here? Goodness gracious. So after the East Germans... Uh, after the East Germans have some of their companies liquidated, there's there's a moment right at unification where uh, there's going to be wage negotiations basically for the East German workers who had just been paid by the government with their employers, with their new employers. How this system was set up is, again, it's very unique to the moment where the employers that they are talking to were also just government employees just a year ago, right? And so now their employers are probably on the brink of losing their jobs themselves because these companies are going to be taken over by West German actors. And because of that, they're going to go on unemployment insurance from the government, which is based on their own wages, which are also going to be determined by the negotiations that they're doing. So you have two sides negotiating that are both incentivized just to raise wages as high as is kind of reasonable. Sure. Okay. So instantly we see a spike in East German wages. Um, and that is, that ends up being bad because we talk about how we want union wages to rise, how we, we cheer on the UAW when they get their raises. The problem is the East Germans, again, are only 30% as productive as the West Germans. And so now you have these really expensive workers making these goods that no one wants and having a market in East Germany even that is open to Western goods, which are way better and which are made by labor that is, as, um, that is priced the same, if not less, than the East German labor. So you basically have these... These, Germ these East German workers who are making nothing of value to anyone, mm. okay? The high labor costs kick in. The unprecedented, le unprecedented levels of competition kick in. And um, East German output because of this falls two-thirds after the first year Jesus. of reunification. Total German output falls one-third oh after the first year. Okay. How did they measure that one third fall? I think it's like it's it's industrial output. Oh wow. Yeah. So that's something. It's it's monetary, I believe. Okay, but that's something. So you're saying and a lot of that falling is obviously in East Germany. I'm sure West Germany wasn't really the ones falling that much, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's the th I don't think West Germany was falling at all. Right. I think having access to the East German market actually boosted, just boosted them. them because yeah. that's just now they're just shipping all their products over there. Exactly. Yeah. And they can't be competed with at all. Yep. Um, so it's really bad in the short run, especially for the East. And because the East is now integrated for the country as a whole, then you have the economy growing. 
you do have the economy growing um, overall, and it does bleed into East Germany because you now you can have movement between the two sides, right? So it does make it so that East German GDP per capita was up to 50% of West Germany's by 1994, which was four years after reunification. They reunified in October of 1990, but unemployment was still 14% and high unemployment persisted throughout the decade. Hmm. Um, Part of this was even though the GDP per capita was rising and the GDP overall of East Germany was rising, um, the previously planned economy was not set up to absorb the unemployed part of the population. Like you talked about with the, the idea of the SPD to maximize employment, that was the same idea in East Germany. And so it wasn't, it didn't have a nimble, agile entrepreneurship scene to be able to innovate and create new companies in the case of um, high levels of unemployment. Now, East Germany's growth in this time was largely buoyed by transfers from the West, which was over 770 billion Deutschmarks up through 1994. And at first, the West German government said that they weren't going to tax at all, that they were just going to fund the the East Germans with debt, but very quickly that turned out to not be sufficient. So it has been funded by a 5.5% tax, the reunification has, which actually lasted until 2021. No way. Yeah, so that's on top of their income taxes and everything else. 5.5%. Um, and in this time, East Germany was a boat anchor weighing down the potential of West Germany's export economy. Because wow. even though the, the Deutschmark was somewhat devalued, which should have made Germany a bigger exporter in the 90s, um, the the East was running a trade deficit equivalent to 50% of East German GDP. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, which was wild. Um, so where do we go from here? This is what's happening in the 90s. Um, and then in the early 2000s, they're, they're kind of starting to come out of it. Reunification is going a little bit better. Uh, unemployment has dropped a little bit, but growth is still weak. Um, because these problems have persisted. Then in 2002, Germany converts to the euro. And all of a sudden, its currency is undervalued compared to its economic output despite the East Germans. Of course, East German production has also productivity has also been increasing in the years since reunification. So this led to several years of large increases in exports particularly to China, which was go growing rapidly. China has been growing at least 6% every year up to 2018 and as high as 15%. Um, it also implemented labor market flexibility policies intended to devalue labor, including reducing pensions, cutting medical benefits, and reducing social security. What year was this? This is early 2000s, 2002 okay. about. So I have a chart outlining the exports of Germany to China. And around starting at 2002, it starts increasing, doubling every two years. Yes, exactly. They they relied on that growth so heavily. Um, and so since they devalued their labor, again, the goods were made cheaper. Um, it was easier to export. And they placed a ton of this emphasis on maintaining international price competitiveness. Of course, this means that they're naturally investing in manufacturing, even though they're a growing and soon to be one of the world's leading economies, which we've talked about before, generally transition to services. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of an incongruence that I'm going to get back to a little bit later. Uh, the, the focus on exports had a real negative effect on uh, people in the bottom half of the German income spectrum, where real wages for the bottom 40% of the income distribution has dropped, have dropped over the past 20 years, right? So you saw income inequality grow and grow and grow in the from the idea that you need to keep your exports competitive, you need to keep labor costs low. 
the the well, real gross domestic um when I'm looking at disposable income for Germans, yeah. right? It kind of flatlines around 2002 for yep. a while. Yes, exactly. And that and this is why. And the problem with that is even though Germany was seen to be strong for about the past, I don't know, 15 to 20 about 15 years. Really in in Germany struggled until this export strategy got them out in around 2005, oh, 2006. 2005 is when wages started increasing again, or they had more disposable income. Okay, okay. that's. But yeah. then it's flatlines again a little bit, yes, right? Yes, then it flatlines again. Yeah, so they, they take advantage of the China factor, but the problem is this hurts their private consumption massively. Because mm-hmm. when you don't have disposable income, you don't buy things. They also didn't have a social safety net because that was part of... Um, reducing of pressuring wages downwards and private consumption is the backbone of any strong economy even in the german economy in these years private consumption accounts for 65 percent of gdp and exports net exports are just kind of a bit of frosting at the top of the cake that gets up to five six seven percent gdp which is enough to have two three percent of growth which looks good for an already large developed economy but it was always going to be a fragile strategy. Um, and so now we get to basically the present day, right? Because Germany had been relying on Chinese buyers for the goods they make, like cars and machinery and chemical production for a long time. But now China one is looking like a warlike adversary in the world on the geopolitical stage and germany like the rest of the west doesn't want to fund their development anymore Mm -hmm. so germany is taking it upon themselves to withdraw but besides that china has also become a competitor in the biggest german industries we've talked about how china is leading the world by far in ev production well evs are in fashion German cars, yeah, they're still going to be able to export them, but the demand for them, the demand for German internal combustion engine cars is not going to be growing in the future no. at all. Machinery, China competes on machinery. Chemicals, China competes on chemicals. And part of that reason is actually because they made joint ventures with German companies who wanted to access Chinese markets. They sold they sold they sold their own death warrant. Exactly. They totally sold their own death warrant and now it's coming back to bite them not only because they're trying to decouple from China but also because producers are going to be looking to China as the new place to set up their plants because of what's now happened with Germany's relationship with Russia. Yes. Cuz Germany made another bet that ended up going badly with another warlike economy where they've been benefiting from cheap Russian gas for 20, 30 years since the end of the Cold War. Now that gas is gone and Germans' energy prices have skyrocketed. Obviously that gas is gone because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in its attempt to do the good thing, which we can absolutely applaud them for in not funding the Russian war effort, Germany has been buying most of its gas and oil from the U.S., which it needs to get on tankers that come all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, meaning energy prices have skyrocketed. Exactly. And imports from the Russian Federation are down 90% year yeah. over year. Exports to the Russian Federation are down 40% year over year. Which does warm my heart. Like, that is Germany yeah. doing the right thing. But God, is it difficult for its economy yeah right so right so german energy prices go up and inflation spikes in the country but more worrisome is these massive german companies look to move elsewhere because they have some specifically energy intensive industries like chemicals production so one of the major chemical companies in germany is called basf Um, or at least it was in Germany, because it recently has moved its headquarters to China because it needed to create it because it had a joint venture there. They're not as worried about energy prices in China, and they're going to be centering their operations and production Mm. in China from now on. See, this is just, and then this goes on the other thing, Germany's decision to get rid of nuclear power. 
Yep. Germany's decision of the Green Party there pushing out the nuclear power in favor of, you know, solar and wind, when nuclear power has made France a very, very energy stable country. Exactly. Just totally signs your own death warrant. Yep. <laughs> Crippled them. Just uh, just the wrong move. They terrible, just made the terrible move. crippling move. Yeah. And so BASF is just one example. There was a survey recently where the percentage of companies saying they want to leave the country doubled over the past year from 16 to 32 percent of companies mm. okay so that's china russia the country that germany now exports the most to since it's decoupling from china is the u.s um the the biggest categories of export goods that germany sends to the u.s are vehicles and machinery which total 66 billion dollars or 40 percent of all exports to the u.s but the Inflation Reduction Act incentivizes an American-based supply chain for those very types of goods, for EVs and for the machinery that's going to go into EVs. So you're looking at an increasingly protectionist global environment that's not going to be as welcoming to German goods. I would argue that the U.S. should be more welcoming. Again, Germany is a close ally of ours, and I think we should keep them closer. But the way the world is going is they don't want to be reliant on exports nearly as much. So this is another area where you're going to see less demand and a much lower chance of growth in exports to the U.S. Definitely. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is, is labor. We talked about how wages have been suppressed um, there was a mild, there was a bit of a spike in consumption in 2015 and 2016 because they did, um, they did implement some policies, they, some social safety net policies, including a state-sponsored pension program and a minimum wage for the country. Uh, I think we're going to see a similar bump for labor. I think we're seeing consumption in the very short term is worrisome because it's been eaten into by inflation, because the demographic picture is terrible, one of the worst in the world. Um, the the majority of Germans, Germany's population is aging out of the labor force and thus are becoming, uh, they're not as big of consumers. Mm -hmm. But I do think the labor movement, like is hitting the U.S. currently, is going to be hitting Germany in the coming year or two, which is going to decrease economic inequality, which it should spur private consumption. So we this past year, we saw wage growth of around 0.6%. So re, year over year, their wages are outpacing inflation. Hmm. But their real disposable income that they have um, in inflation-adjusted dollars is still... Um, barely above what it was in the pre-pandemic world. Yeah. So there, there's really basically seen no growth at all um, for the last, you know, four or five years now. Yeah, which is which is brutal. And and Germany is, this is an interesting conversation because Germany is a really high tax country. Its tax rates, its average tax rate for a, a citizen is 37% versus the OECD, which is a group of another of an, other rich countries, which has an average of 25%. Mm. So I think the the German high taxation, I think cutting taxes for lower income people, middle income people, would be something that's actually really powerful for the German economy. Uh-oh, but wait, wouldn't that mean you have to take on debt? <laughs> it would mean you have to take on debt. Yeah. And I think that is a huge part of the answer for Germany. So this brings us, let's get to the current day. What's, what spurred this deep dive and what has happened recently in Germany, what we talked about last week on the show, is a court ruling said that 60 billion dollars of, or 60 billion euros, about 65 billion dollars of government funding that were earmarked for the pandemic could not be used in 2024. So the ruling coalition has agreed on a new budget for 2024. And it doesn't suspend the debt break, which means it leaves a, that $60 billion gap, more or less, in the budget. Um, this, has re this means reducing the climate and transformation fund of the country by $12 billion next year and by $45 billion through 2027. It means cutting EV subsidies that were supposed to last through 2024 to get the, um, the EV transition going, and instead they're going to be ending at the end of this year. And it cuts subsidies 
for solar. Now, Prime Minister Olaf Scholz has said that those subsidy, those solar subsidies are going to have to make it back in to the budget somehow. We don't know how that is. We don't have an answer. It also cuts funding for railroad upgrades. And these infrastructure improvements are needed desperately right now mm -hmm. when the country has just been cut off from Russian gas and oil. And that is what is driving its inflation. The infrastructure investment is precisely what it needs. And so they're they're trying to maintain their image of like this couth formal accountant yes. of Europe, right? That keeps all of the books balanced. And I think it's just the wrong decision. They took the wrong lesson from the German miracle. Yep. And because they took the wrong lesson from the German miracle, they're trying to replicate what the German miracle was in their head of Erhard being a balanced budget, fiscally conservative neoliberal. And the truth is, that's not what the German miracle was. That's not what made Germany have that 8% growth. And it's not what's going to make Germany have record-breaking growth in the future either. No, no. Listen, listen. Germany, we, we just said debt is not good. We don't like high interest rates. But we, we have to start understanding that everything is a cost-benefit analysis. We can Germany can decide to agree on this budget and not suspend the debt break, right? And then only have a deficit of 0.35% of GDP for the 2024 budget. But the cost of doing that and in not upgrading your, your solar and wind capacity faster, in not subsidizing EVs, the cost of spurring climate change faster by not making this transition is is more detrimental than any debt you could have totally totally and it's higher and the infl and the high energy prices that they'll continue to incur are going to be more painful to the government in the long run i just think this is so clearly the wrong decision i looked into germany's debt to gdp ratio it's, it's very good it's 60 percent, which is so good ours is 130 percent, 120 percent somewhere between there i think it's like 122 so so just and we're not we're not dying yeah. over here we're the strongest economy in the world and i think we have massive problems and i think we do need to tax especially the top end of our earners more because something that's hurting our economy is our income inequality and we need to implement programs to fix that but it is so clear that germany can can skyrocket that debt to GDP ratio and be absolutely okay and help themselves by funding these important programs. Germany needs their own Inflation Reduction Act. They need to fund their own industries. They need their own infrastructure bill. They need the German government to do two things right now. They need the German government. The German government needs to be a bank for infrastructure and climate investment. Just funnel those industries with money, and they need some type of consumer spending. They need to spur some type of consumer spending, whether it's through a middle class tax cut, whether it's through some stimulus checks, something mm -hmm. to get consumers in the German economy spending on German goods. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Thank That's you. That's it for today. Bye. Goodbye.